The Tom Woods Show, episode 2205. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, if you've decided it's best not to have your kids educated by people who have declared war on you, then consider the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. Instructors like me will give your kids an unfair advantage and an education you and I could only have dreamed of. But make sure you join through my link because only there do you get my $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I had a chance to be on the Pete Canona show not too long ago and I wanted to share that conversation with you. I think it's a pretty good one. We talk about the situation that we're facing And we do actually begin by discussing, believe it or not, some genuine grounds for hope. So with that said, here we go. I want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinone Show. Joining me today, the great Tom Woods. How are you doing, Tom? Doing well, Pete. I I want you to know that normally on a day when I go to the gym, I wait to take my shower after I've been at the gym for obvious reasons. But for you, Pete, I took an extra one today before the gym so I could look respectable on your show. Do you live in Mississippi where you're having a water problem or something? I mean, is, <laughs> is it a problem to take two showers in one day or is that? <laughs> no, it's just an extra X number of minutes that I devoted lovingly for the purpose of this program. Well, I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you very much. For that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's get into talking about some topics. I wanted to uh, have you. Well, this is the first time you're on the Pete Quinones show. So tell everybody it a little is. bit about yourself. All right. Well, I've been around for quite some time. In this here movement, I was converted to ANCAPism by Hans Hoppe's book, Democracy, the God that Failed. In fact, I remember raising some concerns to him, like around the year 2000. His book came out the following year. And he was saying to me, wait until my book comes out. You know, this will all be addressed, whatever. So I did wait till his book came out. I read it. So, uh, but I met Murray Rothbard in 1993 at the Mises University and got to meet him a couple of times after that. I have some elite degrees, but I'm increasingly embarrassed about those because could you imagine thinking that Harvard (laughs) University is the center of reason in the country, right? Not so. I guess I got on the map by writing books initially before there were such things as podcasts. And I had some success with the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. And then at the time of the financial crisis of 2008, I urged Ron Paul to write a book about it. I said, now is the time. And he said, ah, I've already said everything I have to say. I have it all out there in my articles and my speeches. I, I just said, that's why the book is so easy for you. He just assembled the articles. But he just wouldn't do it. So I said, well, how about if I do it, you write the forward to my book. And so I, I manipulated him into doing that. And that also had some big success. But mainly what I'm known for these days is the Tom Woods Show, which has just hit 2,200 episodes, which is what happens when you put them out at an inhuman rate for nine years <laughs> running. I think I've told you in the past, it was Meltdown. I bought it when it came out and I read it twice, like in a week. It's Thank you. Because, yeah, I would, well, I mean, I had just gotten into economics and I'm like, all right, well, what's going on here? And then someone's like, well, you have to read this book and everything. And I, I read it. I read it too fast. And then I'm like, I have to read this again slower. That was my, still today, that's probably the basis of my economic knowledge. What I wow, always well, thank to. you very much. Yep, no problem. All right. Let's get into um, some current events here. Let's talk positive because this can get negative really quick. I've been looking at the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and I've been looking at the New York Pistol Association versus Bruin, which was the Supreme Court decision that people can carry guns outside of their house. And I can't help but think that somebody out there might be on our side and might be working in our best interest because these are things that we would, you and I personally, I know, would before for the repeal of Roe, put it back to the states, and for gun rights, open gun rights. So how do you see that happening? How do you think this happened? Well, I mean, obviously, we can argue about the gun thing, about whether that's a local issue or the Supreme mm-hmm. Court should be involved and all that, and whether the 14th Amendment applied the Bill of Rights to the states and that whole thing. That's a separate matter. I used to be a real stickler about that. I used to say, well, I may not like what a state government is doing but I don't want the federal government to step in. Now I feel like it's very hard to get worked up about that because the federal government steps in all the time on behalf of terrible things. And 
it's not like if they step in on behalf of something I believe in that this is going to set some precedent that the left will use. The left is going to do whatever it wants, regardless of precedent, you know? So why am I worried about these procedural niceties at a time like this? But first of all, let's note that I don't know of anyone who really expected Roe to be overturned. I mean, we always hear these sob stories that Roe is just about to be overturned, and, but it's a fundraising gimmick. That, that was always a fundraising gimmick. Both sides were kind of winked at each other. We all know it's not actually going to be overturned. But in the meantime, we're going to make hay with the threat that it will be. And then when it was, I was completely shocked. I, it's not that I'm always right when I predict what's going to happen in politics, but I don't think anybody saw that coming, especially because the appointees to the court, you could, this Amy Coney Barrett did not strike me as a woman who's really going to stick her neck out when push comes to shove. Brett Kavanaugh seemed like with some of his decisions, he'd been trying to make it up to the left. You know, look, I know you think I'm a stupid frat boy, but look, I can vote with you guys sometimes. So that didn't, you know, just those two factors alone didn't make me think that this was likely to happen. And then it did. (laughs) You know, so I take that as a positive in the sense that occasionally, even now, we can still be pleasantly surprised by something instead of every single day, your face is ground into the dirt in a brand new way. So whether that means there's somebody behind the scenes, I don't know, but it does mean that at least a few of those people sitting on the court have some stones. We'll put it that way. Do you see it crumbling? I look at the federal government and I just, I feel as if it's coming apart on them. The stance they've taken on so many things that are so controversial, that are so, you know, if we would have even started talking about them five or six years ago, you'd be like, there's no way we're talking about this subject. Do you see it falling apart? The facade's definitely coming down. And I think it started, it really started when they built that fence around the Capitol. I was so happy. Remember when they did, I was like, oh, this is what an illegitimate government does, you know, in any banana republic. Do you see it falling apart? Ah, this is almost too much positivity for one show here. I mean, maybe. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. I have notes here. It's going to get negative real quick. Okay, fair enough. Fair fair enough. Maybe it is. Maybe. I mean, sometimes I'm afraid that I get too optimistic because I personally, in my personal life, do live in an echo chamber. You know, my wife agrees with me. My kids agree with me. My friends agree with me. So it seems to me like everybody is on my side, you know? So I have to be careful with my being like a Pollyanna, I guess. But certainly it seems like it's a good thing that the legitimacy of the regime itself is in question among a very, very large group of people. Now, we are not influential people in the sense that we're not, you know, we don't write for the New York Times and we're not Hollywood actors, but there are a lot of us. And not to mention, I guess I suppose I should think this way, even though Joe Rogan is not 100% one of us, he's still a bold guy who will sometimes say some necessary things. And he's got between 10 and 20 million listeners, whereas how many people are watching the typical CNN TV show? So I guess I should pause when I say we're not so influential. We're more influential than we realize, especially all the trans stuff that they're pushing. It just seems incredible to me that they could think that there's majority support for that. I mean, they're living in an echo chamber with people who demand that their pronouns be used and stuff like that. It seems like in regular America, there's just no way this flies, especially when, I mean, it might fly if it's, the usual leftist tactic of making people feel guilty. You're a hater if you don't go along with this. And most people don't want to be called names. They just want to live. They don't want to take a stand. They don't want to be unpopular. So, okay, I'll go along with the crazy thing. But when they added on the child thing, and we're seeing photos, I mean, of kids after these surgeries, how can you possibly think that's going to play? And I would think any Republican nominee has got to hit that. As goes, just use these images and, and use images of that, use images of burning cities, you know, all these atrocities we're seeing, like in our own country, and say, look at, you know, you might not like everything about me, but I think we can all agree this ain't no good. This dystopia they've built, this is no good. And you may not even want to tell a pollster that you're going to vote for me. You don't have to. But when you get in there, you know what you need to do if you want to live in a civilized society. More positive here. <laughs> Did you see the raid on Mar-a-Lago as the positive that I did? I guess I did in that at this point it, well, yeah, I don't just guess I did. The way I thought was, geez, the anything concealing the nature of the regime has now been removed for this thing. And, you know, it's funny, Bob Murphy had a tweet 
on Twitter that he meant sarcastically. I don't know if you saw oh, I this. Saw it. Oh, it was great. It was great. It, he meant oh. it sarcastically. And all oh, these people are coming at him from left and right because they don't understand his point. He's saying, thank goodness we got through all these previous presidents without one of them breaking a law. But unfortunately, the streak has been broke. And so some people are saying, hey, you stupid Marxist. Trump didn't do anything. And, you know, and then, <laughs> right? So, but that was, that was right. I mean, obviously, that was right on. You think about, obviously, the corruption of previous regimes, let's say, you could write volumes and volumes about and nothing, and, and nothing. Whereas every misplaced semicolon from Trump is like an atrocity. So to me, I, yeah. But on the other hand, I mean, who knows what they'll do with this document gate thing? I mean, who knows what, yeah. you know, obviously we know what they want to do, which is to tr- somehow disqualify him from taking office again. You can't put that, past, you can't rule out that that's a possibility. Well, the New York Times showed their radical consistency and, you know, the way they laid out that picture of the documents that they found at, at Mar-a-Lago, yeah. like they did when, you know, they raided Jeffrey Epstein's, oh, wait a minute, they didn't do that. Right, Sorry. you remember that? Okay. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... There's a word you've used a couple times already that I saw people are now starting to catch on that we're using it is regime. I and I saw it. Yeah, yeah. I saw everybody from the Jennifer Rubin class to the Jonah Goldberg people saying, well, you're using that term. And, you know, we, we talk about regime change in other countries. It's like, OK, it's, it, I mean, I think I think that people are using that word is another positive. Yes. Right. Because there's a. There's a whiff of illegitimacy about it when you say regime rather than the government, because the government sounds like something. And look, I love Leonard Reed, right? He was a brave guy who started the Foundation for Economic Education. But the government is something that we would have said when we were, you know, criticizing agriculture policy in 1958, you know, but this is a different world now. And I don't want to use the same word. I want to indicate that something is not quite right. This is like hanging the, the flag in the distress posture using the word regime. Yeah. So yeah, I, I just love it. Of course, I what I've also been having fun doing lately is, I mean, and I shouldn't waste my time. Why am I doing this, Pete? But there are progressives out there who will, they just can't believe that they're so unhappy about Joe Rogan or they're so unhappy about this or that, or they're really upset at Glenn Greenwald. They can't stand Glenn. I think you don't like Glenn Greenwald. I haven't got a prayer, but they don't like Glenn Greenwald because he, you know, well, he's making excuses for the right wing and this and that. So my response is, as always, I always say to them, look, you're absolutely right. We all know that Hillary Clinton and Mitt Romney and Henry Kissinger are just trying their best to pursue our interests for us. You know, we, we all know that. And it's so rude for somebody to stand up and be an obstacle to them. And I never stick around. That's always a hit and run. I don't want to see their stupid oh, yeah. response. That but was great. I, I just want them the last one you did was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want them to think if, if I could possibly get them to think for one minute. And I love I throw in Mitt Romney because they probably think they're against Mitt Romney, but they're not really. They're not. Really. <laughs> Mitt Romney would stand with them a billion times over before he'd stand with with you or me. Sure. All right. Let's start getting a little negative. Um, okay. You had mentioned how Leonard Reed in 58 was talking about agriculture policy. And after 2020, I've been saying just the world changed. I mean, we're. I see it like 10 times after 9-11. I mean, you and I were adults on 9-11, and we saw what happened after 9-11. What I've seen in the last two and a half years is the growing tyranny, the growing totalitarianism is way worse than what we saw after 9-11. That almost seemed like a yeah. practice run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Using practice run in 9-11, and that's funny. Um, but, okay, so one of the things that they were able to do in 2020 that a lot of people aren't talking about is they basically, the medical industrial complex has always been there. But I mean, they've increased it. It's reaching Leviathan levels that we could have never predicted without COVID. So where do you think they go with this? Because well, like, think about it. The pe- they built the Pentagon. As soon as they built the Pentagon, you knew that we were going to be in perpetual war because they had to use it. There was a reason they built it. They don't build this to watch it crumble. This is built for something. Yeah, that's true. Now, on the other hand, I may be introducing more positivity here. But on the other hand, there is a very substantial chunk of people, not only in the U.S., but around the world who are not going for it anymore and who were awakened to it by COVID. Now, if you look at my archive of podcast episodes leading up to 2020, you won't find many 
that go directly at the medical establishment. You, you find some criticisms of the FDA because they're not approving drugs fast enough or whatever, but you really don't. And I, and I always thought to myself, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going down that crazy kooky road. And now I think, geez, you know, I, even at my age, I'm learning things. And even at my age, I realize how naive I've been, you know, as recently as my forties. So it did have the effect of, if it changed the way I look at the medical establishment, where I feel like, I don't know that I can trust them on anything. I mean, if I get a broken leg, they can put a cast on it. But I'm not sure, given what I've seen among ordinary doctors, I'm not sure what I can believe because we have people with shockingly little curiosity, a shockingly great amount of willingness to conform. You know, look, I'll do and say whatever you want me to say as long as I can collect my salary and go home. Why would I trust them on, on a lot of other things? And I was just talking to a friend. I, he might want his book to be a surprise. So I better not say his name, but you know him. And unbeknownst to me, he's actually working on a book he's almost finished with about the medical establishment. And he was saying, I've actually looked deeply into a whole bunch of different areas of medicine where there are standard practices. And it turns out in case after case, there's just no evidence to support what they do. But they walk around in these white coats and in the stethoscope and they seem very official and, and we cower before them very deferentially. And maybe that's, I wouldn't say that's coming to an end, but there are a lot of skeptics out there. I mean, for example, why did the vaccine passports ever get reversed? Why would they ever have gotten reversed? All the people in that establishment want those. They all want them. And yet even the holdouts had to eventually get rid of them. Now, why is that? Because there are enough of us Economically, they could not prosper without us. Now, Canada is another matter, but they could not impose a mandate on domestic or international air travel, even though they wanted to. So that's why I think there is some reason for hope. Yes, they are building something bad, but we just discovered that they can't fully implement it the way they want because all the deplorables out there are going to resist it. And it worked. We just held out. No, I'm not going to go to that concert hall. No, I'm not going to take that trip. No, I'm not going to comply with this or that. And we just waited them out and we won. You can see sometimes that if there's a real backlash to it, and especially from the productive class, they do back off. We, I mean, we've seen that over and over again. The person who's writing that book, would he happen to be an investigative journalist? Uh, he would happen to live in Scotland. Oh, okay. So I know that person. Okay, okay. good. All right. I'm wondering. Okay. Hey, everybody, a quick word on behalf of Blinkist, our sponsor. You and I have an enormous amount of stuff to learn and a very short amount of time in which to learn it all. And the Blinkist app can help us do that. You can get the key takeaways from thousands and thousands of nonfiction books and podcasts across a huge variety of categories in just 15 minutes. You'll be educated and entertained at the same time. You'll never be without something to say. You'll have an opportunity to get the gist of a wide variety of perspectives. It'll seem like you've read the Library of Alexandria, in effect, but you and I will know the truth. You will find all kinds of modern bestsellers available on Blinkist, but you'll also find old classics of the sort that you and I would enjoy reading, like Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty, or The Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater, or Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. And thanks to their brand new feature, Blinkist Connect, you can share titles that you found particularly stimulating with your best friend, along with your own comments. So it's like having two accounts for the price of one. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. So it's like getting two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Again, Blinkist.com slash Woods. The next thing, when you hear the term extremism in 2022 coming from the White House press secretary, uh, what are you hearing? How's that translating for you? It's so bizarre because, of course, it means that every single occupant of that office of the presidency before her, I mean, you know, before her administration was an extremist. Every American president, every American hero, that we've ever had. Almost everybody who ever lived would qualify as an extremist. So it's not really clear what it is that they want us to conclude from this. 
that basically everybody has been stupid and backward until them when they are not exactly the most intellectually impressive people in the world seems like rather a stretch. But yeah, I just hear it as normal people, just ordinary people who just want to live the way everybody always lived. That's extremism. I wrote a column about this because, of course, the word extremism, what does that even mean? What a dumb word. I mean, I've never used that word. I've never used that word as a pejorative. Oh, that guy's an extremist. I mean, you could use it with an adjective. You could say an environmental extremist. Well, that's legitimate because there are environmental extremists who hate mankind. But just an extreme. Well, tell me, extremely what? If you're upset at me, I want you to tell me the exact nature of your dispute with me. Tell me exactly what am I saying that's wrong? And don't just tell me that I'm extreme because maybe I'm extremely awesome or an extremely good writer. Nobody would be upset about that. But just to say you're extreme and then to get her clarification on this, her clarification was even worse, which was to say, if you are at odds with a majority of Americans, that is an extreme way of thinking. And so some people were happy to point out, well, that would make you extremists because you're underwater in your approval rating with the Biden administration, right? But of course, what would this mean if you were not part of the majority? You're an extremist? Well, there are a lot of groups that aren't part of the majority. I mean, outright socialists are not, strictly speaking, part of the majority, that they don't criticize that. Vegans are not part of the majority. You know, that there are a lot of groups that are not part of the chess players. You know, so I, I would think I would think people who are willing to transition their children at four years old were extremists. I that's I consider them extremists. They are extremists. That's true. But even then, I I just I hate that stupid word because because yeah. it's just such a dumb, cheap left wing sort of word. I would rather say I don't know much worse words than that <laughs> that are more clarifying. Well, I mean, there's no better example or proof of Carl Schmitt's friend enemy distinction than what we're experiencing now. I mean, Trump pandered to groups that were never going to support him. I mean, he yeah. did that throughout his four years. And now it's like, if you don't agree with the regime, you are on the enemy list. And even people who are obviously left, like Glenn Greenwald and you know Michael Tracy's of the world, they're yeah. the enemy. I've been saying it's a dangerous time to live in, but as somebody who loves history, I have to enjoy what I'm living through. You know, because <laughs> times like this are rare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I sometimes I have an eight year old. I mean, I have five children, but I have an eight year old who's, you know, I don't want to ruin the innocence of her childhood by telling her about all the terrible things going on in the world. So she's blissfully unaware of all this. But someday I'm going to have to tell her about what it was like in 2020 and thereafter, what began happening. And America was never perfect. And I'm not a big flag waving kind of guy. But this was a pretty decent country uh, that you could raise a family in for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And we should never forget that. Yeah. When you look at the going off of the gold standard, and then you look at like housing prices after that, and the price of everything after that, it is real easy to see why they had the women's liberation movement of the 60s had to start so they get women out of the house so that they could start working because now people aren't going to be able, you have to have a two income household. It was just, I've been talking about social engineers a lot, and there are people engineering things that it's easy to see the last hundred years, especially when you know the progressive era, and you go forward into a lot of the you know, progressive era was big about eugenics too. And then you go forward and you're like, oh, I see all of this. It all comes into play. It's There are people who can steer the culture, and look where we're at now. <laughs> well, the thing is, if you, but if you think about some of the progressives from a hundred or so years ago. It's quite easy to imagine a great many of them being appalled by the 2022 version of progressivism, you know, that they would say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. This went way, way too far. If you look at, well, I always use this as an example because I love this old show called What's My Line from the 50s and 60s. If you look at the people who are on the panel, of What's My Line, it rotates, but a lot of the people are the same. And you see how sophisticated and well-dressed and debonair they are, like, um, Bennett Cerf, who was the editor at a publisher at Random House, you know, Bennett Cerf was on the panel, no doubt, to draw attention to Random House. But he was, even though he was a, an establishment liberal, he was so well spoken. He was charming. He was friendly to people who agreed with him or disagreed. His account, uh, I'll get to my point in a second. I am working to something. In his memoir called At Random, you can actually read about his interaction with Ayn Rand because he published Atlas Shrugged. And he was saying to her, look, the John Galt speech is just too darn long. 
you know, and it's just repeating things you've said earlier in the book. So we got to cut it. And he said, I will never forget what her response was. She said to me, would you edit the Bible? <laughs> and that, then I realized I was never going to get anywhere with her. And he said, you know, I could sit around all day listening to her cockamamie philosophy. You know, so, okay, so a little disparaging. But then he concluded his section by saying, this is a brilliant woman. And no one in the progressive world would say that these days about her. So my point is, you can find a lot of people who outwardly conform to bourgeois expectations and were very civilized and pleasant. But there's just something about leftism that it can't ever stop. It can't just stop there. Okay, now we got this particular win. Now we're just going to stop. Anthony Esselin wrote an essay for Chronicles that I hope is available online, where he said, the key thing that you notice about the ongoing progressive revolution is that it's motivated by a hatred of rest and repose, of allowing people just to enjoy their families, their lives without agitation. They hate that more than anything. There can be no rest or repose, even for themselves. There's always something else. There's always some new frontier. The people they supported 10 years ago who may want to get off the train now are now the enemy. There's something disorienting about the whole enterprise that it can never stop. If you ask them, what would be your ideal end? There just isn't one. Yeah, that's the brilliance of progressivism. They don't have an end because it has to keep going. It's just going to keep swimming. You know, Cthulhu just swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming way left. One of the things about, you were talking about progressives and how you had progressives back then who seemed to be at least rational, but you always have the people on the fringes are always the ones who win because they're always well organized and they always know exactly the direction that they're, okay, we're going to steer it in this direction. And, you know, it's very easy for a small group of people to be more well organized than a bigger group of people. That's why the federal government, which is what, 2.1 million employees, but really how many are actually running anything can be more organized than the 330 million masses out here because you can't organize 330 million people. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. So, all right. Let's go to this. One of your recent emails talked about a lawyer. What's her Jenin? You never think of that it would be pronounced this way, but it's Janine Eunice is how okay. she says it. And she is bringing a lawsuit basically for like people like Jay Bhattacharya Bardic, and yep. uh, Martin Koldorf, who basically they were censored during COVID. We know this. And the federal government, it was the government that yeah, did it. It was. The so yeah. are we going to get discovery? What, what do we expect to come from? We this? are going to get discovery. Apparently, Fauci is going to be part of that. I forget who else, but. They just had a recent victory where the judge said, we need the following people to turn over everything they have relating to this issue. Now, I don't know how any of this works. I don't know how easy it is to just destroy evidence. I don't know if there's a, an electronic paper trail that's left that you can track. Now, I just don't know about how the technology works, but, it, but it's definitely a case to keep an eye on. I believe the attorney general of uh, Missouri and then also of Louisiana are involved in prosecuting the case. And from what I read from the attorney general of Missouri, he seems like a pretty good guy because he the way he described the case is exactly he used exactly the words I would use. So this is definitely a good thing. Also, if they thought that they could just do this with no consequences, well, I don't know, maybe they'll still get away with it. But forever in the history books, if you look hard enough, you'll find that the government was sued for suppressing dissident voices. You had another email talking about the fact checkers. It just seems that, can we put together a right-wing fact check site? Yeah. I mean, that seems like something that, that needs to be done. I know, it's our podcasts are the fact check right. sites, really, because this fact check thing, you have to hand it to them. I mean, all of a sudden, the infrastructure for it was all in place, and they, they rolled it right out, and they got a lot of gullible people to think, well, these are impartial, dispassionate individuals who are just trying to prevent people from being misled. Uh, I'm not really quite sure that's exactly what it is. They're obviously partisan. Some of the fact checks are so nitpicky. I mean, apart from the times when they're outright wrong, they're ridiculously nitpicky. I gave an example the other day. Now, this is not, strictly speaking, a fact checker, but there is a Twitter account and a website called Retraction Watch, and they will post when a paper has been retracted or corrected or something. Well, there's a professor at Stanford named John Ioannidis. It's a Greek name. And he's been pretty good on COVID for quite a while. 
I believe he wrote what may be one of the most widely read medical journal articles of all time. And it's called something like why most published research is wrong. It's something like that's really provocative, but it's from 2005. And just a few weeks ago, Retraction Watch tweeted out that John Ioannidis 2005 paper just earned a correction. Well, when you look at what this alleged correction was, it was missing a closed parenthesis in a formula. They give no context. They just say, yep, you know, he had to be corrected, which of course is meant to make it look like you really can't trust this guy. You know, I mean, we actually had to go out of our way to tell you he had to have a paper correct. Well, even the former dean of Harvard Medical School, which is not exactly a listener of your podcast, Pete, even he had to say, look, (laughs) well, okay, maybe perhaps in secret, right? (laughs) He's not openly, he's not wearing the t-shirt. We'll put it that way. Of course, yeah. But this dean even said on Twitter, look, this is obviously unfair to Professor Ioannidis. I mean, to just put this up there with no context is obviously meant to embarrass him. It was a missing parenthesis. He is owed an apology from Retraction Watch. It just goes to show what we all know. We all know that there's an agenda behind these things. And I was subjected to one of these. I actually had a fact check on a talk I gave. It was only a 20-minute talk back around November of 2020, and it was called The COVID Cult. And I was never there. Had- yeah, you were there. That's right. It was great. I mean, and it was, it was an unmasked audience, which was really great. I loved that which was very hard to find a venue yeah. in November 2020. And, and the people who worked there were wearing masks when we got there and they were taking their masks off by the taking time. Taking their we masks off. Yeah, I got to tell you, take a mask off story after I finish this. So okay. I gave this talk, had a lot of charts. The charts make these people look ridiculous. And the video got a million and a half views and then was taken down. And when it was taken down, I got the, they rubbed salt in the wound by accompanying it with a fact check. So I devoted one of my podcast episodes to going through and refuting the stupid fact check. I mean, it, it was really dumb. It was really a dumb fact check. One of the things was I made brief mention of the so-called Great Barrington Declaration, which had said we shouldn't have society-wide lockdown. We should let people kind of decide their own risk profile, but certainly let the young proceed with their lives and the, the arts should be open and all this other stuff. And I made oblique reference to that. And they called me on that. They said, well, some health officials say that's a bad idea. How's that a fact check? Okay, (laughs) some do, but some don't. So why am I getting dinged for that? So the whole thing's ridiculous. But the other thing that makes me happy with regard, because you mentioned taking masks up, were you at, I think, was it St. Petersburg or it might've been St. Petersburg last year for the Mises Institute Supporters Summit? Were you there? I wasn't. I, I was there, but I had to leave. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jeff Dice and I did this thing on stage where we were going through Hans Hoppe's, um, is it what called What done. Must Be Done? Yeah. yeah. So we went through that and took some questions. And it was a great hotel, the Don Cesar. And we all liked it. And, but the staff was all masked. Even in 2021, their staff was all masked. And so at one point I had the mic and I said, now look, it's been great. The hospitality we've been shown at this place has been great. But you know what? The staff wearing masks while everybody else is unmasked is, you know, creating, I don't remember exactly what I said about it, but, it, you know, there's the a two-tier system and, you know, and right. the, the masks obviously are the most ridiculous failure. I, I don't know. It's hard to say the most, but one of the most ridiculous failures of public health. And as long as anybody can remember, they obviously don't do anything. So what I would say to the management here at the Don Cesar is unmask these employees. And that got a huge round of applause. I had some staff members giving me a thumbs up and a few of them started taking it. Because I get, think they figured, even if I get in trouble, I can just say, look, the people were demanding it. Don't you want, isn't the customer always right? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Oh. That's awesome. Oh, so um, sad. It was like, it was like a tear down this wall moment. <laughs> a woods tear down this wall moment. That's right. That's amazing. <laughs> hey, everybody, I want to thank our sponsor, Policy Genius, by letting you know that even though the prices of pretty much everything you buy these days have been going up, Life insurance rates have actually been coming down since this time last year. And since life insurance typically gets more expensive as you age, that means now is a great time to buy. And if you're concerned about price, well, that's what Policy Genius is all about. It will make sure you're not paying one cent more than you have to for the coverage you need. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in one place to find your lowest price on life insurance. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Options start at just $17 per month 
for $500,000 worth of coverage. Just click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com to get personalized quotes in minutes and find the right policy for your needs. The licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. They're on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make decisions with confidence. And don't worry, Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees. It doesn't sell your details to third parties. It has thousands of five-star reviews. It has options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. So head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. All right, let's um, let's move on to this because this is uh, something from a couple weeks ago that I'm sure everyone was talking about. We have this class of intellectuals that people look to now, and some of them are even considered to be IDW, intellectual dark web. I call them the intellectual dork web. They, many of them seem to be just gatekeepers to try to keep people from moving to the right. They want to keep people in the center. And what it means to say about the middle of the road is leads to socialism. Sam Harris did this interview for a podcast, and I've watched it many times and I'm looking at him. And I'm like, is he being serious? Is he being sarcastic? Is he being hyperbolic? I don't think he is. So when you heard some of the things he was saying in this as, you know, an intellectual, somebody that I know people who were contacting me who were going, I really like Sam Harris. Sam, I used to follow Sam Harris. I've watched his debates. What did you think when you were hearing him say this? Well, hold on. But the only thing that I saw it may have been from a different interview was his thing about we have telescopes up there. We don't see heaven or God. So where are they? That was the only thing I saw. So what's the other stuff? Is it oh, uh, where he basically evil? Is it that? No, he he basically said that um, Twitter censoring the New York Post about Hunter Biden's laptop should have done that. He said he didn't care if Hunter Biden had dead children in his basement. Oh, that that's no, right. Yeah. That, I'm you, sorry. You, I, now I remember. Yeah. When you and he said, basically, look, Trump was such an existential evil that to tear down the way that things have been done in this country for decades and decades and centuries was fine because Trump is such an existential evil. What was, what was your reaction to all that? Yeah, well, it clarifies the nature of the two sides here because I'm pretty sure if people we like had dead children in their basement, we'd probably stop liking. <laughs> yeah, if, you know, uh, I'll put it this way. If it was Donald Trump Jr.'s laptop, that would have been... That's the only thing CNN and MSNBC would have reported on oh, for yeah. months. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we all know it. It's hard for me as a, you know, a kind of an intellectual of sorts, I guess, because I've made my living talking about and explaining ideas. And I mean, I've kind of thought of myself, even though Voltaire was kind of a POS, but I think of myself as like a Voltaire in that even though I do have original ideas from time to time, I'm kind of a popularizer. Like I can take complicated things and explain them to ordinary people and and I enjoy doing that. But then suddenly to realize that the nature of the battle you're in is not an intellectual one anymore. I mean, yeah, there are still some people who will be converted by a good argument, especially younger people, if you catch them at the right time. But other than that, this is just brute force, it looks like to me, that, that he's basically announced to me that there's nothing you can say to me that will change my mind. That's what he's basically said. There's nothing you can say to me because I'm willing to look the other way at murder, if that's what it takes to get my way. He's saying there's nothing you can say, even though he fashions himself an intellectual, you can't ever change his mind. So maybe I have to think about the time I spend trying to change the minds of a whole lot of strangers out there. I mean, I wouldn't say that's wasted time, but maybe I need to reallocate my time in the direction of speaking to people who are indeed already with me. Yes, indeed, the forbidden preaching to the choir that we're always told not to do. The choir needs to be preached to. You know, there is no church where the pastor says to the choir, I'm about to preach so you guys can go out and have a cigarette. The choir stays there and listens to the sermon because they need to have their courage, you know, bucked up. And so likewise, people out there who are disorganized and scattered and afraid of what's coming next and they feel like they have no champions. They have no spokesmen. Everybody hates them. You know, famous people are going out of their way to make certain they understand how unwanted they are. That's a rough, rough world to live in. And maybe it's them I need to talk to more, not the general public. Hey, antitrust law is not such a good idea, but maybe it's these people. Look, here's what you can do 
to survive the current onslaught. So I have been shifting some of my efforts and my time toward more practical things. Now, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with spreading ideas. I'll never, ever feel like that's the wrong thing to do. But yeah. I have only so much time on this earth, and I want to have as much of an effect as I can. So I have shifted a bit to helping people figure out you know, how to relocate to a more hospitable place, even if they're on a budget, you know, or how to educate your kids when most teachers can't stand the side of you. How do you educate them, especially when you feel like you just don't have the resources for homeschooling? What do you do? Or they are stripping away the value of your money. What exactly do you do? I can sit here all day long and talk about what Mises meant by entrepreneurship, and that's very valuable, but I've been spending more time focusing on the people who already agree with me, but who don't know what they're supposed to actually do. You know, I mean, what I've been thinking about lately is what makes my listeners stay up and lose sleep at night? What makes them lose sleep at night? And it's not that they don't know enough details of the life of George Washington, important as that is. It's these things that I've just described and more, the medical establishment. How do I get medical care when suddenly I realize I don't trust any of these people anymore? I mean, these are all really practical obstacles and challenges that people are facing. And so when I see a Sam Harris, it kind of affirms me in my new orientation that if I'm going out there trying to convert, I mean, especially when you think of F.A. Hayek's approach, his essay, The Intellectuals and Socialism, his approach was we convert the intellectual class and then the ideas will trickle down to the, to the general public. Good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, that, that is absolutely not happening. So I'm not going to spend my time trying to appeal to a Sam Harris. Instead, I'm going to find Joe Blow out there and see what we can do to, to help him when they come for his job because he won't take the jab or something. Yeah, I think privately we've talked about how at this point it's basically figuring out how to survive this hell personally for your family and everything and to keep the ideas and the ideals that we have going and to yeah. make sure that they survive the future. One of the things that I wanted to mention about that Sam Harris clip is, you know, to me, when I look at that, if I look at that as a, if I'm a politician, if I'm not even a politician, if I'm a campaign manager or something like that, and I have any Machiavellian streak in me, I look at that, especially if I'm on the right and I'm like, well, that just opens the door. It means that we can do that too. That means that we can do everything that we can, everything at our disposal to destroy a candidate, to make sure a candidate doesn't get, I mean, it, at this point, we have the largest campaign of like systematic child abuse in history and it's public health. You know, <laughs> how do we stand by and watch this? And even if the parents were okay with it, you know, how do you not step in and say you can't give purity blockers to an eight-year-old? So where does it end? How far does the slippery slope have to be traveled before you know, we see a reaction like we saw in the early 20th century to something very similar, to, that something is almost, well, I think we're worse at this point than Weimar was. What do we do? How do you not just be like, we have to strengthen ourselves, especially in local communities. Family starts first, personally, locally, maybe state, but that federal government out there too plans have to start being made. And I don't know how, you know, ideology doesn't work in practice. Conservatism has never been tried. Liberalism has never been tried. It's always preferences plus power. So how, how do we do this? How do we navigate this at this point? Oh, Pete, I, I, I'm so sorry you're asking me this question because I want to ask you this question, honestly, because it seems like this shouldn't be difficult at all. It seems like everyone should see the absurdity of this. And yet somehow it is an amazing case study of how people can get cowed by the establishment. I, I mean, because you know there are some people who have to, in their heart of hearts, be saying, look, my opinions from five years ago were not really that unsound. You know, that all of a sudden I have to look at the world completely differently and use crazy pronouns and this and that. And the fact that it, it's got people feeling like they can't say anything about it, or at the very least, they stay silent. Some of them, the bravest ones stay silent. That's the brave, the bravery. Uh, the generally, uh, people have been going along they congratulate. Like, you know, you look on social media, somebody posts, hey, look what my kid just did. And the comments are congratulatory. I just from the I, right. From the right. From people yeah, who call themselves you, the right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, I personally know somebody who got in trouble with the establishment for his previous views that came to the fore. And so in order to beg forgiveness, 
which you just never do, right? You have no, to, if you never. have one thing, you have to have your dignity. Um, he began to throw all his former colleagues overboard and uh, talk about them and now how he's a changed man and he's not like those people who have the opinions he held 10 minutes ago. And he specifically went after this issue and said, you know, it's about time for conservatives to make peace with all this and it's important and this and that. I mean, and the thing is, nobody... It's exhilarating for some young people to be able to call every adult in their lives a bigot. There's something exhilarating about that. But it's not true. It's ridiculous. But in terms of what to do about it, all I can say is boldness. I mean, speak your mind. Because this is a case of the choir desperately needs to be preached to. Because this is like a church where the choir up to now has been preached to by a Marxist. And they're desperate for some real preaching. And that real preaching has to come from you. Now, it doesn't, everybody's going to have his own style. I don't have the edgelord meme style, but that has its place too. But all I can say is don't shy away from it. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who has a book on this. It's called Hidden Agenda. That's uh, Jared Casey, formerly of University College Dublin. And he, the thing is, he, he, oh, you know him? Jared Casey? Yeah. I mean, his book, I've, you know how many books I have? I've never talked to him, but you know how many books oh, I have? Of okay. his oh, Freedom is, Progr- Freedom is Progress? It, yes. I mean, it's, it's, well, do you notice in the introduction of that book, he thanks me for giving him the idea to write it. Yes. So it, <laughs> yes I was I driving to the airport and I had no idea that he was going to write like an 800 page book or whatever because of something I said. But yeah, so he has a brand new book on this. If you've never seen him speak, there are only a handful of videos of him, but he is so funny and charming that he's disarming. Like even with a subject like this, He's going to do it in a way that, okay, obviously the crazies aren't going to be satisfied with anything, but that I think an average person listening would say, this seems like a reasonable person's take on this issue. So I'll recruit him. But honestly, just just be bold, publicize things. When you see crazy things going on in your town, in your school, whatever, just plaster it all over social media, stuff like that. I mean, call attention to it because the more attention it gets, the better. There's a reason that they don't want parents knowing what's going on in the classroom. You know, that there's a, there must be a reason. When it comes to local politics, I take the, I mean, local politics is much easier. If you live in a small town, it's much easier to, for 10 people of like mind to get together and take over the school board and do you know, stuff that Hoppe talks about. Yeah. And the boldness that you talk about, you're going up against people who will destroy you. How do you beat people like that unless you are willing to meet them with the level of kind of venom and power that they're willing to use? Yeah, that basically you make yourself an internet celebrity by sharing video clips of yourself speaking at the board meeting. You share unhinged clips of them screaming at you, you know, and you and you reach out to influencers and say, can you tweet this out for me or, or can you show this to the world? And then suddenly you find you have an army behind you and then you don't feel quite so alone. I want to finish asking you this question. And I know this is a, um, I don't think it'll get you in trouble with your fans because I think that I'm one of your fans and it would not, this wouldn't offend me. Okay. Um, if, if you had to um, like bet a certain appendage on your body on whether the United States would be full on anarcho capitalism in the next 50 years, would you? No, of course not. <laughs> 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 I va- I highly value various parts of my anatomy, so I would not. <laughs> but I mean, even so, even if there wasn't a bet as such, in your opinion, can I mean, I've talked to Walter Block about this, and Walter well, Block not like, capism, but the more interesting thing is, will would there be national divorce? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and uh, maybe if we keep divorcing, we get down to a unit where we could have it. But I did release, you know, I have an ebook on it. So I have an ebook called National Divorce, The Peaceful Solution to Irreconcilable Differences. And so I give it away for free, but it's actually at nationaldivorce.com. I bought How that. How did you get that? Oh, it cost me. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I bet. Yeah. You, yeah, it you know what? thousands of you know, dollars. You know what I got recently? What? PeteSubstack.com. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. I was like, how did I, I how did I get Tom's podcast.com? There's nobody else named Tom. With a podcast, tomspodcast.com. I got it. So sometimes there are those low hanging fruit just waiting for you. It's amazing. All right. Plug anything you want. I really appreciate the talk. 
Oh, my pleasure. Well, I would say the key thing right now is check out nationaldivorce.com because you'll find in there, first of all, chapter one of that book, you will never look at the world the same. So check that out. But also it's got material in there from Jeff Deist, Michael Malice, some of your favorites, some not so favorites will also be in there, but you're going to like it. So it's at, you'll have the satisfaction of typing in nationaldivorce.com into your browser, knowing that that important domain is in good hands, let's say. I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for another week of episodes of The Tom Woods Show. We're talking Russia and Ukraine on Monday, so make sure and tune in for that. And if you are enjoying The Tom Woods Show, then you will be like a kid in a candy store inside my supporting listeners program because if you think The Tom Woods Show just on its own is a wonderful way to spend your time while you're driving your car, then wait till you see all the goodies waiting for you inside The Tom Woods Show Supporting Listeners Program. Among them is my Tom Woods Show Elite group, which you will very much enjoy and benefit from being a part of. But that is just one of many things I bestow upon you as a kind supporter of The Tom Woods Show. So check that out at supportinglisteners.com, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.